Elliot, if I may ask you to start by introducing yourself. Sure. So I'm Elliot Felix. I'm the founder of Bright Spot Strategy. We're a consultancy that guides organizations to their future. So we help them think about the kinds of experiences they want their users and their staff to have. And then we help them think about what they're going to need in terms of their spaces, in terms of their service offering, in terms of their staffing and their organizational design uh, in order to create those kinds of experiences. And um, we do that for a variety of organizations in higher ed and culture uh, in the corporate sector. And looking forward to today's conversation. Well, what as as you appreciate what uh, what I want to talk about is the the higher ed experience, mm -hmm. um, and uh, perhaps we could start by talking about the North Carolina State uh, University Hunt Library sure. and how that assignment came to you and and what kinds of things uh, were involved. Okay. Well, the Hunt Library, I think, was a real was a real dream project, and it's happened in a couple of phases. Um, the first phase uh, was the initial programming and planning that happened uh, that I led as part of an architectural team as a sub-consultant for Snohetta, the Norwegian architects that were the design architects and uh, working very closely with a local architecture firm called Pierce Brinkley, Cease and Lee. And as part of the visioning and the programming process, we were really after uh, what the library of the future could be. And um, and it was a really interesting, engaging process, talking, you know, looking at literature, searching far and wide, trying to understand the trends, read the tea leaves, engage with um, students and faculty and staff and also affiliates, uh, because it's it, the project is located in um, Centennial Campus which is a new campus for NC State in Raleigh. It's kind of across the street from the main campus, and it was started about 20 years ago uh, with a really innovative concept to be this kind of intersection of university and industry. So it's it's sort of part university campus, part corporate office park. And the library was really gonna be a turning point for them because all these, uh, all the prior development, all the prior de buildings on campus were kind of um, not quite self-serving, but they were either, you know, for a specific engineering department or for a specific company. And there was very little reason to leave your building, very little reason to cross paths, and uh, very little reason to kind of fulfill that um, intersection of university and industry vision. And so the library was kind of a linchpin in the development of the campus because it was kind of be sort of the first common space that would bring people together. Uh, and and so a, a unique opportunity for the you know for the university they were sort of determined to do something different they were all decided that they wanted a real signature building that they wanted to make a statement that they wanted to make a library that only NC State could make and and through a through a real sort of intensive and and uh, engaging kind of visioning process we uh, we really thought about how the library could. Uh, could be uh, looking to the future and could could do a number of things differently. Um, one is it could it could sort of fulfill a new and emerging value proposition for libraries, which is not just being places to access information uh, as an individual, but rather a place to not only do that but also create things, uh, right? Digital things, physical things, uh, and do that creation and that accessing uh, together. So there was a real emphasis on uh, on collaboration, on creation, um, and there's also, I think, a real emphasis on um, uh, the use of technology and making something that uh, is is of and for an engineering school and an engineering campus, right? So the, the vision for the building was really uh, to be a kind of a technology incubator, uh, to be showcasing the work of the students and faculty to be showcasing and trying out new experimental technologies. And those technologies range from uh, how you store and access a book. So we, it's an automated storage and retrieval system. It's about seven times as dense uh, as books on open shelves. And you can get to a book in five to 10 minutes. So oftentimes less than if you were browsing on the shelf. Uh, you find it on the call number or you find it on this sort of virtual browse platform that NC State developed. 
uh, and you request the book and, you know, you can do that from your dorm and it's sitting there or 10 others are sitting there uh, waiting for you to check, check them out and, and check them out on, on, you know, on your own uh, or with, you know, or with help. So the, the vision was how do we support creation, collaboration? How do we in incubate technology? Um, how do we kind of rebalance the proportion of space, right? To kind of fulfill this new mandate by compressing the amount of space that books are stored in and increasing the amount of space for people and interaction and, and collaboration. Um, and then I would say another really important part of the vision, which was kind of started early on, and then there was a kind of a whole second project to flesh this out, was coming up with a really innovative service model, right? Because as libraries take on these new roles, they can't just provide the same services. And if you really want to create an innovative space, you have to think about the services that are offered in that space in parallel. Uh, otherwise, the two things will not be meshing together and they'll be kind of fighting each other. And, and you see this a lot, actually, in, in kind of legacy libraries, you see um, empty service desks. You know, you see places where there was used to be a reason to provide help and, and now it's, it's just kind of empty and nothing says, you know, nothing says I can help you like an empty desk. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna well, jump let's, in. Let, let's talk about the um, uh, that's the the library side and it's rich uh, its implications have to do with uh, the change from printed pages uh, in vast quantities to relatively modest quantities let's talk about the other things that you see beginning to migrate into the library in other words in the sense that there are spaces and functions and activities that we see in the library that really have nothing to do per se with that printed material anymore well i think that's a i think that's a good point because that you know it as you're thinking about you know where libraries are and where they're headed this new balance of of space for people and space for books um, is one part of that vision this new mandate for kind of creation and collaboration is another part of that. Um, this need to rethink your service offerings and think about it uh, in a way that integrates uh, with your space and, and and connects the digital and physical. These are all these are all parts of it. Um, and uh, another key part, as you're thinking about the services, are partnerships, right? So. Uh, I think the world is becoming more complex. People have less time. People have less resources. So, uh, so many libraries are really thinking about the student experience, the faculty experience. They're thinking about what are the services they can offer within the library, and then what are the ones they can, you know, on their own, and what can they offer through partnerships. So, for instance, you're seeing things like writing centers, things like centers for teaching and learning excellence. Um, where you know a writing center, you know, just makes sense to be in the library because you might go to get help finding a source and be consulting with a librarian, and they may say, "Well, you know, we can help you, but it seems like you might not have the kind of thesis for your paper nailed down, or it's we're not quite sure what you're trying to achieve with this video. So maybe you need some help on the kind of communication side before you get into the kind of content side." Uh, so it's just kind of a natural affinity to have uh, communication centers, you know, things like the Knoll Center uh, for Creativity in uh, Eastern Kentucky University is a great example of that, um, or, uh, or writing centers, um, centers for teaching and learning are also are often great places for faculty to think about how they can redesign their courses, how they can develop new content, how they can try things out. Um, maker spaces are emerging in libraries. Right, because uh, the number, the, the the number and kind of things that people produce as part of their work, as part of their scholarship, as part of their research, is getting more and more diverse. Right, and you might, and we we certainly saw this at Georgia Tech, uh, another another project we're working on now. Right, where people are not only writing the paper, but they're creating, they're designing the device, they're creating the video to talk about the de device. Um, they're uh, maybe they're even uh, working on their pitch to demo the device, right? And and what they're creating isn't just a, a paper or a device, it's maybe even a new company. 
um, or a new investment opportunity. So there's there's all these uh, all these kind of new functions, new roles uh, that that are coming into the library, uh, and and there are these kind of digital and physical hubs of hubs of activity and and of relationships. Uh, sometimes doing these things on their own, sometimes doing these things um, in partnership with with others. Well, that. That group work that can take place in the library uh, is certainly an important aspect. Let, let's move for the moment to the more traditional setting, the mm -hmm. so-called classroom, or what we've ex historically called the classroom. What kinds of things do you see happening there? What Your clients are asking you uh, to rethink that or help them rethink that in some way. Um, what's that conversation like? Well, I think with with classrooms, it's a it's it's a similar discussion and 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 certainly related to the library discussion because I think the first, you know, one of the big drivers for how libraries are changing are that people are more uh, mobile. They have access to things from lots of different places. Um, they have lots of different choices in where and how they can they can work and study and learn uh, in, in, as an individual and as a group, and all those things still apply to classrooms. So, kind of the biggest, uh, the kind of the, perhaps the biggest thing that's affecting classrooms is the realization that um, the learning that happens in a classroom uh, isn't a discrete activity; it's part of a continuum of, of activities in and out of the classroom. So. You may, uh, there may be a short lecture, there may be group work, there may be uh, work on a project before and after class, there may be uh, consulting uh, sources, videos, um, what have you, um, in and out of class. So, uh, so it's really kind of a, a continuum of activities uh, and you need kind of a, an ecosystem of different spaces that are kind of connected and related to support those activities. And so I think the first part is is sort of not thinking about the classroom in isolation, but rather connecting it to this whole spectrum of spaces and activities and, and, and resources and people. Um, and then within the classroom itself, uh, there are a number of things that are you know that are happening. I would say that the biggest one is the sort of the realization that um, that time that that face to face time is is rather precious. And uh, and that time should be best used for interactive and engaging activities uh, through which you know there can be information transfer, but information transfer is is part of that uh, you know through a lecture, for instance, uh, is just sort of part of that whole spectrum. Uh, it's not the whole spectrum. Uh, so this is often referred to under the under the sort of the umbrella of active learning or, or project-based learning as one part of it, and it may mean that uh, you walk into a classroom as a student and the first 10 minutes are a you know are a are a lecture of some kind to kind of get people oriented, introduce a topic, introduce a tool, set of resources. Then there's some uh, some breakout groups at a table or uh, in pairs uh, or you know somewhere from let's say two to six people uh, where people are working on things. Uh, maybe they're reporting on their progress in real time. Maybe there's a way for them to share what they're working on with uh, other people at the table, other people in the room, other people outside of the room, right? And sort of connecting that room to other places or connectivity is another, another big thing. Uh, so it's just becoming a much, it's just becoming, there's much more consensus around the idea that the classroom is really a place for interaction. And if, if you're just talking about sort of content delivery, that can best happen sort of before or after you're, you're in the room or, or you just need some portion of your time together to, to do that, but, but certainly not, not all of it. Some have talked about the uh, physical constraints that exist within some existing classrooms. Um, and some have said, well, shoot, we can move chairs around and we can make these things uh, work perfectly well. Um, what's, what's your view of that set of issues? Well, I think there are, there are definite, um, 
there are definite constraints because this, uh, if you think about the kinds of things that we've just sort of talked about as being important, like connectivity to other places, uh, using technology to display uh, not only to connect to other places, but to display work uh, in real time or to enable collaboration in real time, or the flexibility to shift from uh, a, a, a kind of a, a, a one-to-many lecture mode to a many-to-many um, -many group discussion to a you know few-to-few -few, uh, group discussion. Uh, these kinds of things. Those all come at a cost, right? And the, the technology comes at a cost, uh, an upfront cost. Uh, then it also has a lot of ongoing costs in terms of refresh and support uh, and training. And the space also comes at a cost because that flexibility is rarely free. Um, you know, traditional classroom environments might have one seat for every 15 to 18 square feet. You know, if you're thinking about a very traditional uh, environment where you have a tablet arm chair, you know, the kinds of chairs that we all learned in high school and, you know, carved our name into the desk on, probably not, or maybe wrote our name. Um, you know, and now if you think about that little kind of piece of real estate, it's, it's drastically insufficient, right? How can you fit a notebook, a laptop, a cup of coffee, um, your arm, some, you know, some paper, uh, you know, your phone? on that on that little you know piece of real estate it's 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 not going to happen and also that's just kind of your piece of real estate right how how can you if you want to like share a surface or or work together very hard so instead of that 15 to 18 square feet uh you probably need at least 25 to have a kind of a table um and if you want those tables to be moved around uh, so that you can reconfigure that from, say, rows to like a U-shape for a seminar discussion or or different kind of like clusters in the same room. Um, then you're looking at not only that 25 square feet, but probably 30 or 35 square feet. So it's it could be as much as twice as much space. And and that and that costs money. So you need to have some some kind of way of making a case, some kind of way of of returning on that investment. You might be able to use those rooms if they're more effective. They might be in greater demand. You might be able to use them more. Uh, you know, if the learning is more effective, perhaps you don't need as much time in class, and you can have some of that class out of time. Uh, you know, some of that time out of class. So, uh, you know, instead of meeting for uh, three hours a week, maybe you only need two hours a week. And so if the room is, you know, uh, let's say the room is 50% uh, bigger, if you're using it 50% less, then effectively it's, the, you know, it's the same amount of space, the same amount of kind of seat time. So there are different mitigating strategies, but um, to do these things right, it all, it all costs money. So you have to be really smart about how you do it. Yeah. One of the projects you you worked on uh, perhaps are continuing to work on as an initiative that was uh, organized under EDUCAUSE that had to do with the rating of classrooms. I think it's it's a more complicated title than that, but the concept was to be able to rate environments um, in a way not unlike the LEED rating system perhaps is modestly analogous to that. Uh, any general comments about that effort, its uh, successes, opportunities going forward? Sure. Well, that that project, uh, which is uh, it's called the Learning Space Rating System. There's probably going to, you know, at some, hopefully at some point we'll come up with a more creative name or a better acronym. Um, but the the genesis of that was uh, was a project when. Um, I was at my uh, former firm, DGW, and we were working as part of a, a team, uh, Shirley Dugdale, my colleague and I, um, and it was, it's a really good, really good example of sort of good ideas can come from anywhere. And, and people talk about this in, in companies and you, you think about your culture and you think about your organization design and so many people are so focused on, you know, where, where you know, uh, how are we creating a place for good ideas to emerge from anywhere? And this was a case where we had a, a very junior consultant uh, who had just taken the lead 
uh, rating exam, a uh, lead, uh, lead accreditation uh, exam. And in parallel, we were developing uh, design criteria for classrooms, for sort of 21st century classrooms for a, for a project and had everything pinned up on the wall. Uh, and this guy, Roger Torino was in his name, looked at it and said, hmm, you know, these criteria look a lot like, uh, like what I just saw in this environmental performance. And of course, we, you know, everyone was familiar with it, but, you know, it was sort of connecting the dots. And we thought, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we could take these criteria and instead of using, you know, or in an analogous way to how um, LEED or BRIAM or Green Star or um, AC Stars, any of these, any of these sort of systems uh, articulate a sort of set of performance criteria for a space to measure environmental performance. Perhaps we could, we could create a set of criteria for uh, the effectiveness of a learning space, and, and in particular thinking about how well it supports active learning, the, the kinds of activities and the kind of flexibility and the kinds of connectivity that I, I was just talking about. So we created the, you know, it's been a four or five years now um, of everyone kind of moonlighting and uh, a, a series of great, um, great contributors uh, with no spare time uh, creating this initiative in our spare time, a uh, number of different universities and, and and uh, the Educause Learning Initiative. And we created a, a set of criteria in six categories. So it looks at um, the campus context, so how well it ties into what's going on on campus, strategic planning, master planning, all these kinds of things. It looks at the process to create them, right? How, you know, is it participatory? Are you looking at best practices? Are you engaging users? It looks at the support uh, model. So, you know, are you not, just like putting this stuff out there and if you build it, they will come and somehow we'll figure out how to support these new kinds of spaces, but you're actually kind of proactively thinking about that. And those are sort of more like institutional uh, criteria. Then there are uh, three sections that are more about the room and the kind of the unit of analysis is the room at the moment. Uh, so it looks at kind of the uh, environmental quality, let's call it for the, for the room. So sight lines, proportions, uh, ceiling heights, views, these kinds of things. Uh, then it looks at the, the furniture and the layout of the room, and then it looks at the technology of the room. And so for each of those things, you get a, you get a score, and uh, and then you can rate that you can rate that room and see how well you're doing. And I think the tool, the more people use the tool, the more powerful it will be because you'll be able to put your score uh, in context uh, with others. And even if you don't, similar to kind of any of these environmental rating systems, even if you don't get a kind of a certification or go through the whole scoring process, these the these design criteria are useful nonetheless, right? You could you could sort of take the the things that are talked about in the support section and use those to guide the development of a of a of a really effective support model or or the process section and use that for the a really effective process section and. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of uh, power there. Um, I've actually been surprised that institutions haven't latched on to that and begun to use it for competitive purposes um, in terms of uh, in terms of being able to recognize how good their spaces are. Uh, the one thing I have found in that vein is that the larger the institution, the more diffuse typically the responsibility for an ownership of classrooms winds up being, or at least it can be. And that stands in the way of them being able to take a look at the whole of their learning environment um, as a designable um, set of environments that, that have positive outcomes. As, as, we, as we wrap up this conversation, um, what I'd like to turn to is your observations about the future of campuses, these environments that have libraries and classrooms uh, in them, particularly as we think about the increasing mobility of instructors and students and information. Um, what about that uh, future campus in a digital world? That's a great question. That's a great and I, question. I think a lot of the 
things I've been mentioning that were sort of that are really transforming libraries and classrooms. I think it's really about sort of seeing how those play out, right? So thinking about uh, the, the library, the classroom, the campus as a place for people to come together and create uh, that's really prioritizing face-to-face um, -face interaction and then complementing that with uh, use of digital tools, use of synchronous and asynchronous collaboration and technology so that you know when people come together, uh, it's it's more meaningful, right? And the more digital things become, the more uh, physical places matter. So it's really about kind of think, thinking about that. I think the the partnership piece I think will continue to grow, right? Because there is there's limited resources, there's increasing complexity, uh, there's increasing need to to partner and collaborate and uh, bring in expertise from you know across campus and around the world to uh, provide better res resources, to do better research, to uh, uh, to provide a better experience for students, faculty, uh, and staff. Um, I think creating these kinds of partnerships, um, connecting the digital and physical, uh, enabling people to, to collaborate and, and create, all is going to take new kinds of uh, service models, new kinds of support models. So I think um, the way universities are staffed is going to change radically in that uh, it's going to be a much more collaborative effort. It's going to be a continuous learning environment where people are taking on new roles, uh, where uh, people are providing all kinds of new services. Like, you know, every library right now is hiring, is kind of creating a data services department uh, because, you know, data is, you know, is the new currency, right? In the same way that Writing centers are key to li key to libraries um, in a kind of a, a totally obvious way now. Um, so is quanti you know, quantitative research methods and and uh, working with data, data mining, big data. Um, that's that's sort of goes part part and parcel. So there's all these new all these new service offerings, and it means that the people that are making all this happen have to learn new things. They have to have new skills. They have to be sort of continuously trained and developed. And I think the last part is just going to be not no longer thinking about digital and physical as separate, uh, but really thinking about how they're you know how they're integrated. And this comes up on pretty much every project we do now, right? So you're thinking about all the all these sort of touch points, all these moments of intersection when these two things complement each other. And they're if you're thinking about someone's experience, it's it's almost impossible to separate it, right? So there's at a basic level, there's thinking about how the digital can make the physical experience better, right? So you, you know, people can be better prepared. Uh, they can know where they're going. You know, they can prepare for the, the sort of physical visit, whether it's a library or museum. They can know what's there. They can know what's offered. Uh, they can see the event calendar. They can book a space at the event. Uh, they can connect to the event if they can't go there, right? Then there's navigation and wayfinding. How can people find their way around? How can they know what's offered? How can you make all this stuff that's often invisible, like all the services that a library offers, you know, people know like 1% of it, right? Because it's all, most of it's invisible. So how do you, how do you make it more, more visible and, and enable people to have this sort of serendipitous encounters and discovery, uh, showcase, you know, showcase the work and the things that are going on? Um, how can you enable people to have better access to resources, right? Make it seamless for someone to like book an appointment for a space, time with an expert and the equipment they need, like all in one go. Um, how can you use digital uh, to help better, you know, connect and, and create and, and contribute what they're doing, right? So what's created in a library or, or in a classroom um, doesn't just sort of die on the, the laptop of its creators, but in fact gets, uh, gets made visible, showcased, um, and, and kind of added back into the collective so other people can look at it, be inspired, build on it, and so forth. So I think I think it's an exciting time. I think it's going to have to do with how people work together, how they connect to each other, um, how digital and physical, you know, talk to each other, and um, and uh, and how people work together to uh, make it happen. We could talk for a long, long time about all of those things. I'm I'm sure. Um, and perhaps we'll have that opportunity at some point in the future. 
We've been talking with Elliot Felix, who is the uh, founder of Bright Spot Strategies. Um, very multidisciplinary, uh, multi-client-based uh, consulting practice. Thanks for spending the time with us today.